On January 5, 1943, at 1.30 p.m., a Lockheed Electra plane departed from Boeing Field in Seattle. The flight was headed for a refueling stop at Annette Island before its final leg to Anchorage, Alaska. The airplane was owned by the Morrison Knudsen Company, known for large military and other construction projects in Alaska. On board were Joe Tippetts, a radio engineer, and Susan Batzer, a stenographer, both working for the Civil Aeronautics Administration in Alaska. Robert Gibo, a construction superintendent, and Percy Cutting, a mechanic, both with Morrison Knudsen. Dewey Metzdorf, an Alaska hotel owner, and Harold Gillum, the pilot. After hours, the weather turned to clouds and turbulence, with cold temperatures causing ice to accumulate on the wings. Harold Gillum, known as one of Alaska's skilled pilots, was tested. Nearing their destination, a malfunction in the left engine sent the Electra towards a mountain near Boca de Quadra, an inlet along the southeast coast of Alaska. Gillum grabbed the microphone to transmit a warning. One engine has failed. Anticipate trouble. Seeing the nearing mountains, he set the microphone aside and pulled on the controls, trying to raise the aircraft above the trees. The crash occurred around 6.30 p.m., leading to an explosion with forceful shaking and the sound of crushing metal. The right wing was torn off when it hit trees, which lessened the impact's severity and prevented immediate fatalities. As the aircraft settled in snow, Joe found his thoughts in confusion. In that moment, it felt as if he had ceased to exist. Events had unfolded so rapidly that no reaction was conceivable. Once the noise had died and silence followed, his first sensation was the feel of rain on his face. Astonishingly, he found himself standing on the seat, his head and shoulders through a breach in the fuselage's roof. Upon calling out, he was surprised and relieved to learn that despite injuries, all on board had survived. Susan Botzer sustained severe injuries, including fractures, a skull fracture, and a nearly severed hand. Robert Gabo suffered a broken arm and leg, while Dewey Metzdorf had a fractured collarbone and bruising on one side's ribs. Percy Cutting had a back injury. Harold Gillum had cuts and bruises, and Joe had a deep cut on his forehead with pain in his hips and legs. Joe and Harold, first to regain mobility and worried about fire, quickly moved the injured Robert and Dewey from the wreckage to the snow for safety. Then, with Percy's help, they freed Susan, whose arm was trapped. After checking the risk of fire, they placed her on the aircraft's floor to tend to her injuries. Susan endured her injuries without complaint. Her main concern was for the other's well-being, insisting they receive care. Knowing her condition was serious, she focused on the group's survival. Despite their attempts to comfort her, Susan died on the second day. They placed her body at the aircraft's rear and covered it. The plane's cabin was damaged, making it unusable. Joe and Harold cleared snow, rocks, and debris from under the left wing, constructing a shelter using engine tarps for protection. For four days, continuous rain and snow prevented them from keeping a fire, keeping their clothes damp. Dressed in business attire, they were unprepared for the cold conditions. After the crash's shock lessened, they retrieved their luggage from the plane's nose, changing into warmer clothes. However, the wet weather soon soaked these as well, leading to a cycle of changing until no dry clothes were left. Trying to dry his shoes by the fire, Joe ruined them, resorting to wrapping his feet in rags for protection. They rationed emergency food supplies on board, corned beef cans, sardines, bouillon cubes, chocolate bars, and supplies for coffee and tea. On the fifth day, Joe and Harold heard an explosion, which they thought might have come from a rock quarry on Annette Island. Feeling responsible for his passengers, Harold climbed to a nearby peak where he thought he recognized landmarks. Upon returning, he decided to seek help. Unknown to them, the quiet and cold allowed the explosion's sound to travel nearly 30 miles. Sadly, Harold never returned. A search party later found his body a few miles down the mountain where he had likely died trying to get back to the group. After the Electra disappeared, the U.S. Coast Guard and Canadian authorities started a comprehensive search. They estimated the crash site to be within a 60-mile radius of Annette Island, based on the plane's speed and the timing of Harold's last transmission. The search was hindered by freezing rain, snow, and strong winds. Volunteer bush pilots often faced zero visibility, 
making the operation challenging. The situation was tense, with newspapers in Seattle and Alaska closely following the story, but hope faded as days passed. On January 26, three weeks after the crash, the search was officially ended, with the belief that the aircraft had been lost at sea. By this time, 21 days had passed since the crash, and the four survivors realized no rescue was coming. Joe was shoeless, with rags barely protecting his feet. All were suffering from injuries, frostbite, and the cold, making movement painful. The freezing temperatures worsened their situation, as their limited food supplies meant they were freezing and starving. Determined to find warmer conditions, they decided to descend the mountain, a difficult task due to their weakened state and the steep terrain. They devised a system to lower their supplies, including canvas and wet clothing, in stages, then climb back to retrieve the rest. The effort was especially hard for Metzdorf and Gabo because of their injuries. After nearly two days, they reached the mountain's base, each with new bruises from the ordeal. Percy ventured out with their 22 caliber rifle hoping to find game, but only managed to get a squirrel, as larger game was scarce. The four men made do, turning the squirrel into a soup that they consumed five times using every part of the animal. While the soup offered little nourishment, it provided some sustenance. At the mountain's base, conditions were slightly warmer, and they built a lean-to for wind protection. However, their hunger persisted. Facing the dire situation and recognizing that Gibo and Metzdorf couldn't travel, Percy and Joe decided to seek help. The bonds among the four men had strengthened, making the decision to leave Gibo and Metzdorf behind hard, but it was the only option for survival. In their final preparations, Joe and Percy left their last bouillon cubes with Gibo and Metzdorf, took a last sip of water, and set out in search of rescue. They were motivated by seeing a body of water in the distance, they hoped that by following its shoreline, they might find habitation and help. Their journey was a laborious shuffle through snow nearly eight feet deep, often pausing to help each other out of deep snowdrifts. The rugged and perilous terrain hindered their progress, reducing their pace significantly. The steep hills forced them to zigzag to prevent sliding. The threat of the cold was constant, especially at night when the fear of freezing to death was strongest. To combat this, they slept close together, taking turns to wake each other to ensure they stayed alive. Sometimes, their wet garments would freeze together, requiring effort to separate. Their survival depended on their mutual support, knowing that one's life was linked to the other's survival, and by extension, to the two men they had left behind. The thought of failing their companions weighed heavily on their minds, yet it also motivated them to persevere. Upon reaching Weasel Cove's shore, their hopes fell at the sight of a rocky shoreline with logs, not the sandy beach they had hoped for. Their path was blocked by dense woods, and the sight of ice in the cold waters added to the daunting scene. However, hope emerged when they saw a cabin across the cove. Motivated by the chance of finding food and shelter, they decided to build a raft, tearing one of their few remaining blankets into strips to bind the logs. When they launched the raft, they found it could only support one of them at a time. As the raft began to sink, Joe jumped off, letting Percy paddle across the bay. Joe had to swim back and watch Percy reach the other side. Arriving at the cabin, Percy found an old damaged rowboat and two coffee cans, one with tar residue and the other half filled with rice. Wanting to reunite with Joe, he crossed back, towing the rowboat with the raft. As he neared the shore where Joe waited, the changing tide posed a challenge. Percy fought against the tide and waves until Joe could wade out and help pull it to shore. Once together, with Joe having started a fire, they cooked the rice and ate it with enjoyment. For them, in their situation, this simple meal felt like a lavish banquet. Dedicated to repairing the old rowboat, they spent the next day patching its holes with blanket shreds and sealing them with tar and kapok from their sleeping bag. It worked, but the boat needed constant bailing to stay afloat. The crossing was challenging, but they needed the protection of the cabin. Luckily, when they reached the other side, several crows appeared. Percy shot three with the rifle, giving them a needed food source. They quickly prepared and cooked the birds, eating everything but the feathers. 
Now on a peninsula extending into Boca de Quadra, which opens to the sea, they faced a critical decision. After a journey to a deserted cabin to the south, they decided to head northward towards the open ocean, believing it would increase their chances of finding help or encountering a vessel. On Saturday, January 30th, they started their journey, aware of the slim odds but driven by concern for their two comrades. Seated at the bottom of the boat, they used an empty coffee can to scoop water overboard. However, water entered the boat faster than they could remove it. With one hand for bailing and the other for paddling, only a small part of the boat's edge stayed above water. An hour into their journey, a sudden storm caught them off guard. The sky darkened and the waves grew hostile. They struggled to keep their frail boat from overturning in the rough waters. However, the strong wind and heavy rain were overwhelming and their boat capsized, throwing them into the cold waters and stripping them of their overcoats, cooking gear, and all but their clothes. In a desperate fight against the cold, surrounded by floating ice, they were slammed against rocks and pulled back by the waves. Miraculously, they clung to a ledge and pulled themselves onto the bank. Exhausted, they collapsed, gasping for breath, too drained to move. Their hands and feet were bloodied, their clothes encrusted with ice. Yet they were amazed to have survived without succumbing to exhaustion or hypothermia. Their matches, kept dry in a small bouillon cube tin sealed with tape, allowed them to start a fire and warm their numb feet. They dried their wet and frozen clothes and eventually warmed up. They began returning to their cabin, encouraging each other. However, after more than 12 hours of walking just short of their cabin, they saw a Coast Guard cutter leaving the bay. Using all their energy, they rushed toward it, shouting and stumbling, hoping to be seen. Despite their efforts, it was too late. The boat left, disappearing into the fog. By Monday, February 1st, still believing rescue was near, they faced another day without help. Nearly a month had gone by without a proper meal, leaving them starving and exhausted. Their only option was to stay at the cabin, hoping for a passing vessel that might rescue them. In their search for food along the shore, they had found mussels, but hesitated to eat them due to poisoning risk. But their desperate situation led them to reconsider. Choosing to eat rather than starve, they collected as many mussels as they could and roasted them over a fire. Even a large number of mussels provided only a small amount of food, but in their situation, every bit was valuable. That night, they kept waking each other to check if they were still alive, expecting to be poisoned. When they found the mussels were safe, they decided to get more the next morning. Then, around noon on February 2nd, they saw a small Coast Guard vessel enter the bay, but it steered away from them. They saw the boat about six miles down the bay, near the old cannery. Hopeful yet anxious, they watched the boat and kept a large bonfire, waiting for a sign, but none came. As it got dark and visibility dropped, their spirits sank further. By February 3rd, they encountered another challenge as a blizzard hit at 4 a.m., completely obscuring their vision. By 9 a.m., the storm eased, revealing a snow-covered landscape. With the clouds clearing, they were unsure if the vessel had left the bay. To escape the cold wind, they retreated into the trees, looking for shelter. Soon after, Joe and Percy exchanged a puzzled look, wondering if they were imagining things. But it became clear they had heard the same sound, the distinct hum of a motorboat engine. Peering out into the bay, they saw the boat heading towards them. The sight of two men in a rowboat coming ashore brought them joy. Overwhelmed, they waded into the water and nearly fell into the rowboat. The Coast Guard crewmen were surprised to find survivors from the plane crash. Joe and Percy were quickly welcomed aboard the Tucson. Joe and Percy were rescued from a beach near Boca de Quadra Inlet, thanks to their bonfire seen by the Tucson's crew, who had entered the bay by chance. The crew had seen their distress signal the previous night, but the captain decided to wait until daylight and better weather to investigate. The Tucson sailed for Ketchikan, where Joe and Percy were quickly admitted to the hospital. Despite being weakened and having lost over 60 pounds each, they spent only a few hours in medical care before joining the rescue operation for Gabo and Metzdorf. During an aerial search, a plane with Percy dropped food to Metzdorf, who got out of their shelter to retrieve it. 
Remarkably, both men were still alive. Meanwhile, on the USS McLean, a rescue team of about 20 set out to rescue the remaining survivors. Gabo and Metzdorf had survived eight days in the mountains without supplies. The next morning, the rescue team found them, ending their 31-day ordeal of suffering. Found in a mix of ice and snow, they were evacuated on stretchers. Miraculously, both recovered, though they lost a few toes. The rescue and the survivor's tale captured national attention, making headlines across the country. Their story, marked by bravery and resilience, offered hope and inspiration during World War II, serving as a distraction from the prevailing somber news. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate your time and hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to check out the other great content on our channel. Your support means the world to us, and we can't wait to bring you more. Thank you again, and see you in the next video.